this point, I would like to introduce to you the first speaker, uh, Orlando Taylor, who is a distinguished senior advisor to the president, executive director, Center for the Advancement of STEM Leadership, Field Graduate University. Uh, prior to his current appointment, Dr. Taylor served as president for strategic initiatives and research at Fielding, where he was also the principal investigator and director for a National Science Foundation funded grant to advance women in STEM fields into leadership positions at the nation's historically black colleges and universities and at tribal colleges. Before that, he served in several senior leadership positions at Howard University. I just happened to interact with uh, at that time, Dean Taylor at Howard University. I really enjoy interacting with him. He was uh, one of the architects of the American Association of Colleges and Universities, the National Science Foundation funded preparing critical faculty for the future uh, project. Uh, Dr. Taylor has been a national leader for many years on issues pertaining to diversity and inclusion. It is a distinct privilege for me to welcome uh, Dr. Taylor, and we look forward to your presentation today. Well, thank you, Dr. Philanthropist, for that introduction, and good afternoon, and I should say good morning and af afternoon to the audience this after, uh, the, today. This is a very important panel, very important workshop, and I'm honored to, uh, to be the lead speaker. I want to focus on that topic of leadership as an essential requirement for broadening participation in STEM, because that is indeed what uh, I think is a very important dimension of the whole question of diversity, equity, and inclusion and access in STEM. And rather than start with the model that that many people start with, I don't, which is social justice, I don't start with that. While social justice is important in our nation and representation is important in our nation, I start with the competitive, the competitive leadership or the competitive advantage of the United States and claim that the United States will be unable to retain its STEM global leadership without more diversity and inclusion. And there, there really, there are a lot of data one could, could cite to make that case. For example, the large number of STEM graduates in other countries, for example, in China and India, uh, more global competition uh, for STEM uh, workers around the world. And in fact, many individuals who formerly sought to advance their own work in the United States are going to get in other countries, in other continents, Australia, uh, in Asia, in, in Europe, in Canada, so that we have much different competitive environment than we had, say, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Uh, when the United States pretty much dominated the STEM disciplines. At the same time, there is a decline in the relative numbers of white male college students. And that's the population that has historically fed into the STEM disciplines, white males. But that relative popul that population is declining. Only about 43% of all U.S. college students, for example, are white males. And the, and the rapid growth is in women, 57%, and persons of color which is now constitutes close to 40% of all students in colleges and universities. And some projected in the near future, uh, the majority of students in American colleges and universities will be students of color, underrepresented in STEM. So that's really the context in my view, why representation is so important. Also at the outset of our uh, workshop this afternoon, I think we need to be very mindful that different times and situations often require different approaches for change. And most of us have been focused on something some researchers call first order change, where we rearrange or we refine, or we add new dimensions to an existing structure or organization, re-engineering, if you will, current structures. And that's been a classic model that colleges and universities have followed for decades. We, 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 leave, we leave the organization the way it is, leave the curriculum the way it is, and we, we try to, uh, we may tinker around the edges to make it, uh, make the organization or the institutions more acceptable and more uh, 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 effective with different types of students. 
But that's a that's a first order change, and that's one approach. But I would argue that it's a second order change that we need to take uh, much more interest in. That is changing or transforming the fundamental ways in which a structure or an organization does business. In other words, creating new models with new functions. Also, I think it's important for us to distinguish between leader and leadership. Most people will hear the word leadership and they'll think about people who hold, hold titles, but the leader is usually one with designated or titular, titular authority and resources to make and implement uh, organizational decisions and change, whereas leadership is anyone who acts or persuades others to act to advance an organizational agenda with or without a formal leadership title. Many of us know in universities that the department secretary, for example, may play a major leadership role in uh, student support, for instance, just uh, and faculty support. They're not the dean, they're not the department chair, but they play an important part of leadership. So, and, and student leaders, faculty leaders, uh, alumni leaders and so forth. So I argue that we need second order change to advance rapid participation in STEM. That's because despite decades of efforts to achieve equity and under in, um, in, uh, in inclusion in STEM, underrepresentation is, uh, continues. I argue that new approaches are required to achieve equity uh, and in, uh, along the way also inclusion. Leadership is required. It focuses on fixing higher education more than fixing the Center for the Advancement of STEM Leadership. It's a, it's a collaborative center, research and development center funded by the National Science Foundation originally in 2016. It's a center that has three major components. There's a research component, the primary component, but there's an education component and an outreach knowledge transfer component. And it's a collaboration uh, between and among four, four entities, the University of the Virgin Islands, North Carolina a and State University, both historically black colleges, uh, universities rather, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, and that is the correct name. They changed their name weeks ago. It was the Association of American, uh, American Colleges and Universities, AACNU, and it's still AACNU, but it's American Association of Colleges and Universities. And my institutions are building graduate university in California. Now, we have this project, we call it ASL, uh, as it's our acronym. And our goals are shown on the screen. I won't go through every one of them, but the key, the key ones, uh, one I would like to mention is to, we seek to examine, elucidate, and promote the intuitive and often unwritten codes of excellence in leadership that result in the broadening participation success of HBCUs in STEM. If you go to the, you know, to the literature or go to the books, on leadership, you probably will not find these codes. And yet these institutions do very well. And the reason that I start this conversation with the HBCUs, I could use other, I could use HSI, I could use tribal colleges, but today, they, because of time, I'll only focus on HBCUs. I wanna just comment on why I start with HBCUs and I could, as I said, uh, MSIs. Remember, that HBCUs, HBCUs, if you go to the literature, produce a, a disproportionate number of African-American STEM undergraduates, despite low budgets, modest facilities, two blue chip students, et cetera, in some fields. While these institutions only comprise about 3% of the uh, total number of higher education institutions in the country and an enrolled today about 9% of African-Americans. In some fields, they produce more than 25% of all African-Americans with baccalaureate degrees. For example, in a recent study in math, it was 33%, in physical sciences, 37%. And of the top producers of baccalaureate degree recipients, African-American baccalaureate recipients who obtained a doctoral degrees in STEM, Seven of the top 10 are from HBCUs. And so the question that one has to ask right off, how is that? How could they do that with, with the, the, the 
budgetary situation that they often face, the political climate they often find themselves in, and so on. And I'll comment on that momentarily. Castle is grounded in Bowman and Gallus' four frames of academic leadership. And I would invite you to take a look at their book, the uh, most recent version of it. I think you can see it on the screen. If not, we'll make it the name available. It's called Reframing Academic Leadership. It was uh, published by Josie Bassey in 2021. It's the second edition of a book originally came out with uh, Bowman and Gallows. Same thing, Reframing Academic Leadership. I believe it's the most important book on the topic at the moment. I urge you to, to, to read it. Because four frames of leadership that Bowman and Gallows or Gallows and Bowman uh, speak to really serve as the foundations for our work in Castle. The first frame is called structural, which focuses on a leader who focuses on goals and plans, tasks, strategic initiatives, metrics, and so forth. The political frame, which most STEM folk don't want to get involved with, don't want to get into the politics of higher education, but it focuses on political, I mean, coalition building, conflict resolution, and the like. Human resource frame focuses on human needs, relationships, team building, and the like. And the symbolic frame focuses on build, inspiring faculty and, and, and indeed the whole academic community, building a sense of belonging. Sometimes they may use slogans and so forth to do, 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 uh, to do work, but those are the four frames that Bowman and Gallo speak to. Now, with respect to HBCUs, you'd have to argue if you say, well, they're so successful, could it be leadership at various institutional levels, which I've implied a moment ago? And could it be the addition of a fifth frame that Bowman and Gallus don't talk about? We call it in Castle the soul of leadership. We're not talking about soul food or soul music. We're talking about the collectivity of values, beliefs, legacies, perspectives, spirituality, personality, and, and cultural context that provide the basis for how one sees the world, how one interacts with people, objects, institutions, and the physical environment, and provides the framework for leadership. And so the one would argue that this, this dimension of leadership is a critical attribute of leadership in HBCUs. So then we go back to the question, why are HBCUs, how are HBCUs so successful in broadening participation in STEM? Castle claims, Indeed, it is leadership at many institutional levels. And that leadership is derived from the African-American cultural context or the African-American cultural experience. And you, there's some common phrases I put on the screen that you often will hear in these institutions. Uh, standing on the shoulders of others. Uh, students being told they've got to be twice as good and work twice as hard to be successful and so forth. A high value on role models and mentoring the young, very important dimension, and a strong adherence to traditional cultural values. Never forget where you came from. Stay connected to your community and to your family and to God. In our work at Castle, we have learned several things. We uh, have a special edition of the Journal of Negro Education at d &E that's uh, published in December 2021. I'm not sure it's available yet, but it, it, the date will show December 2021. It's on our work and the work of others who have focused on leadership to broad participation in STEM. But there are some lessons we've learned. I was, I'll leave you with these thoughts. Number one, and most importantly, and this is a nod to one of my colleagues in the audience today, context matters. Context and leadership matter together. Secondly, broad, broad participation requires more than focus on the cognitive domain, uh, more than a focus on the structural do domain, using now the Bowman and Gallows model. Broader participation requires a focus on institutions, systems, and leaders, which is a bit of a difference from a focus on the students, viewing the student as the problem, the student that needs to be fixed, not the institution, not the leadership. So the, broad, the, our, the, the lesson that we have learned in Castle that it requires a significant amount of attention and in many cases, re-engineering 
both in thought and practice on systems and leaders. And then one thing we've learned for certain is that HBCUs and other MSIs should be seen as having successful, maybe even the best models for broadly participation and indeed can inform all, all of American higher education, not just minority serving institutions. So that if one really wants to, to learn how to do this, they should make a pathway to the places like Howard or Morehouse or Spelman. And I, I didn't have the time to go into some of the numbers, but if you take a school like Spelman College, which is a 2000 student institution, women, a women's college, and you know women are underrepresented in STEM, that's another talk for another day. Spelman ranks number two in the country in terms of producing African-Americans of either gender, of, of, any, of any sexual uh, designation and obtaining doctoral degrees upon their uh, graduation from undergraduate school. There's only 2,000 students. You can think of a lot, I know a lot of institutions, predominantly white institutions with far more students than Spelman, far more African-American students. Right in Atlanta, for example, Georgia State has 10,000 students, 10,000 African-American students. That's more than Morehouse, Spelman, and Clark Atlanta put together. They rank 39th in terms of producing African-Americans who obtain doctors in STEM. Spelman's number two. Morehouse is number 11. Clark Atlanta's in the top 20. So there are lessons to be learned from all institutions. And so rather than seeing these institutions as, as a special focus that could only to deal with their population, they have models that could be useful for all of us in higher education. And I'll stop there.